here we go. Part five, sensation and perception. We're looking at perceptual organization, how we organize these different things that we're seeing. So we have light, we have sounds coming into our ears, but they're not just these little distinct little parts, right? We have to group them together and make sense of them. And so that's kind of what we're talking about here today. So starting out, first of all, we have this term called gestalt. Gestalt is a German word and it basically means whole, all right? And so this whole thing that we're talking about today is about the kind of this gestalt process, how we look at things and get meaning from the whole, the whole picture and not just these little individual parts. Gestalt psychologists look at the whole rather than the individual parts and see because how everything is together is more important than the individual parts um, for our reality, right? Our cells, we're, we're made up of a whole bunch of things, right? Cells, blood, water, eyes, lungs. All those things are nice by themselves, but they really don't do much. You have to put them all together into one human being in order for those things to be really valuable. And they all have to work together. So it's just like a one whole. That's this idea behind Gestalt. Um, one of the things with talking about this process that we're talking about is figure ground. And figure ground means that we separate what we want to see in the figure. We separate something from the background. So whatever we're trying to focus on, we'll see as, and that's called the figure. So the figure is what we're trying to focus on. That's our focus. And everything else is the background. All right, everything else. Um, an example with uh, sound is if we're in a crowded room or in any type of room where more than one person is talking, we're listening to the voice of the person who's talking and all the other sounds becomes the ground. So the figure is the voice of the person that we're talking to and the ground is everything else. So that, that would be figured ground with, as perceiving sound. Um, with vision, if you see a person and then the background uh, on a photo, somebody's taking a selfie and post it on Instagram and they're taking it by the beach, the person would probably be the figure because that's who you would see first, right? Especially if it's got a face in it because human beings, right? We like to uh, recognize faces. And then the, everything else, the surrounding would be the ground. If you were just looking at that background, if you said, well, those are just some gnarly waves in the ocean there, the ocean would become the figure and everything else in the picture would become the ground. Here's kind of a neat example of this um, figure ground. Uh, if you look at this, most people uh, might see ground first, right? So you see this G here, you see R, O, U, N, N, D. So you see ground. So ground becomes the figure and everything else on this page becomes the uh, ground. So figure is what you're focusing on and ground is uh, else. You can look at it another way. And if you look in the inside here, you see this F, maybe I should use a different color. You see F, I, G, U, R, E. So if you focus on the inside, you're, you're creating a different figure. So even within the same perceptual set, even within the same thing that you're looking at, you can change the figure in the ground depending on what you're focusing on. So in this case, right, we have if you're focusing on the middle part, figure becomes the figure and everything else becomes the ground. Or if you're focusing on the black part, ground becomes the figure and everything else becomes the ground. So figure is just whatever you're focusing on, grounds everything else. Then we, we have this thing, of we, we group things together, just as human beings, we naturally group things. It's pretty much innate in all of us, but it's something that we just took take for uh, granted a lot of times, but it's been studied and it's actually kind of interesting. So. We, we group these different things in different ways. I hear about five different ways that we group them. Proximity. So, for instance, if I have lines here, I, I perceive this as three sets of two lines, right? So one, two, three. When you're looking at that, you see three sets of two lines. You group these two lines together as one set because they're close together, because they're proximal to each other. Similarity would be if I did uh, something like this. I would group these into three columns going up and down, right? And I would group them that way um, because these are similar to each other. And I wouldn't have grouped it like this with this similar uh, going across ways. Most people would go up and down because they're similar to each other. Continuity, if I have something that kind of looks like this, in reality, this could be a number of things, right? This could be a whole bunch of semicircles, just 
with a whole bunch of line segments running in between them. But we tend to see this, right, as one continuous line going all the way through and one continuous straight line going all the way through. When in reality, we don't really know if that's the case or not unless we saw somebody draw it. We saw me. But um, so we tend to make this continuity amongst things that might not necessarily be continuous. Um, we then have this other idea called connectedness. Connectedness would be if I had something like this. I tend to connect, uh, see these things as one unit, two balls connected by, or two circles connected by one unit because they have a line between them. So we see them as connected. Rather than a, a, a circle, a line, a circle, a circle, a line, a circle, we see them as all one unit. And then others oh, should say closure, not closer. Closure, closure is where we tend to just close the gaps on things where we think there should be gaps. So if you're looking at this picture up here, we tend to see a box here, right? Do you guys see a box? Or you tend to make a box out of this if you look at it for any length of time, right? And you get, and you see a three-dimensional box. When in reality, right, what is it? All it's made up of is a couple of weirdly shaped shapes all together, right? They all kind of look the same. And we tend to see these as circles, right? We make the closure between them. And we tend to see these white uh, empty spots as, uh, as a box. We tend to make uh, insert things in there, right? So this is how we group things together. Additional ways that we perceive the world around us is with depth perception. Depth perception is our ability to judge distances and how far things are away, right? Because we have these different wavelengths hitting our eyes. Our eyes interpret, you know, what we're seeing, but how far away are they, right? What, what, what are we looking at here? Is it small? Is it big? Uh, what are we looking at? And so that's what depth perception is. Um, one of the ways that, early ways that depth perception, depth perception was tested was with visual cliffs. And the scientists took um, babies and they put them on the edge, uh, they put them on a bed, and they had this this um, glass wall here, and then their mom would be over here. All right, so you have a little baby crawling, right? And the baby would come up to the cliff, right? This is all bed here. This is a bed here, or this is a... <clears throat> and then here would be this glass, this glass piece going across, and the babies would come up to this, and they'd all stop. And so what that showed us is that babies are born with this uh, depth, this ability to depth perception. Um, what we've learned now is right, that depth perception is kind of something that's uh, it grows, it gets better with time. And uh, one of the ways we use depth perception is with binocular cues, right? We have two eyes, and we see things through each eye. The images that come in come in at slightly different angles, right? Because we're, they're about two and a half inches apart. And the bigger the difference is that our brain right in the back, so it shoots to the back of our head after it goes through our thalamus and our brain interprets it, the bigger the difference between what this eye sees and what this eye sees tells us that it's closer, right? Because if you close your eyes and go like this and you see that thing move back and forth, uh, something that you're staring at, you have a big difference between the two things, it tells your brain that the, the thing's closer. You're looking at something far away and you switch eyes like that and there's not going to be as much difference. Um, this kind of, oops, I don't know why I just did. Stop. Hold on, I'm going to have to pause this to figure out what I just did. All right, <clears throat> I don't really know what happened there, but it looks like I got it fixed. Um, so here's an example of kind of what's happening in here. So here's our two eyes, right? And we see bigger difference between this, this guy that's closer, right? Because you see this eye is going to reflect off this point, this eye, so we have this, this gap here. But when we look at something farther away, like this tree, you know, this point which is here and this point which is here, so those two dots are much closer to each other than these two dots are. And so our brain, because these two dots are farther apart, there's a bigger difference, we're going to judge that police officer is closer. And that gives us this idea called retinal disparity. <clears throat> there's a disparity. Disparity means difference between the two images when they hit a retina. Um, so that's vision. Now let's look at some more motion perception, perceptual content, constancy. But this uh, kind of this cool idea called the five phenomenon. This is kind of like when you have Christmas lights and you know you have your Christmas lights here, and they're blinking different colors. 
right? And then it, oops. <clears throat> and then this one goes on, and this one, then this one, then this one, they go, and it looks like they're moving, right? That's called the five phenomenon. Or you might just have them blinking back and forth. Uh, Red, green, red, green, red, green. It looks like it's one light just shooting back and forth, back and forth. That's the five phenomenon. It looks like it's moving. Our brain just interprets it that way. Perceptual constancy is kind of a really interesting thing that our brain does. <clears throat> it allows us to kind of maintain this idea of what su something is supposed to be. So maybe we're looking at something that's red and the light changes uh, around us. We go from a, a bright room to a dark room and we know it's supposed to be red. So say it's like a Valentine heart. We know it's supposed to be red, but the room gets dark. We're still going to perceive it as red because we know that it was supposed to be red. If you recall back to uh, part one of this, we call that top-down processing, when we use previous knowledge to help us judge or perceive what something is. And so perceptual constancy is big time top-down. Top down. Uh, if we don't have any previous experience, our perceptual constancy is not going to be very strong. So uh, top-down processing helps with that. Same thing, here's an example of perceptual constancy with this door. Right, we know a door is supposed to be rectangle, and even though it changes as it's opening, right, we still, this doesn't look like a rectangle, but we perceive it as a rectangle. We know it's supposed to be a rectangle, so we perceive it as a rectangle because we know it's a door. We know what doors are supposed to look like, and so we have this perceptual constancy. We came from some strange land where doors weren't rectangle, <clears throat> and uh, you know, we lived in the, the Hobbit, and all the doors were round, and we all of a sudden then we saw these rectangle doors, things might change. But um, our top down or previous knowledge has them as rectangles, so they stay rectangles. Likewise, with color constancy, we tend to judge things uh, based on what color they should. So that, that idea of the red staying red even though it kind of changes. All this kind of goes to show you this really kind of neat idea that <clears throat> our perception is not just a projection of the world onto our eyes or into our brains, right? It's not just this perfect um, translation of exactly what we see. What really happens, right, is we get these sensations that are then disassembled, right? They, they come in these vibrations or waves, they're disassembled, and they're processed, right? They go through our thalamus, to our visual cortex, to our auditory cortex, to wherever. They're disassembled and they're put back together, reassembled into some functional model that our brain is able to make sense of. Right? So we basically take all this raw data, goes into our brain, our brain takes that data, breaks it apart, and puts it back together, and it shoots out what, what we think we're seeing, what we think we're hearing, what we think we're feeling. And that's kind of this really neat uh, idea, but it also shows us that everybody's perceptions are different. We create, our brain constructs our own perceptions, our brain constructs them. So what we're perceiving is unique to us, and uh, unlike anybody else. One last little thing with color constancy or uh, perception. If you look at this <coughs> um, picture here, look at block A here and look at block B here, right? So we have this green thing here that kind of throws everything out of whack. <coughs> and if you look at it and I ask you which one's darker, just about every single one of you is gonna go A is much darker, right? But it's not true, they're actually the same exact color, right? Look again. They're exactly the same color. Don't believe me? All right, let's look at the next one. If we draw a line between them using the same color that A was, you can see that A and B are exactly the same color. If you don't believe me, this is in <clears throat> your text. You make a photocopy of that page, cut off the squares, and look at them. They're going to be exactly the same color. All right, so that's it for this part of sensation and perception. We got, I think we got two, two more parts to go. Thank you.